thanks for coming, everybody. I'll try not to scream into the microphone. I'll try not to let the microphone scream at you. And we'll see how this goes. And I guess we, we needed all that extra time to get this set up. So I am here to talk about making the migration leap. Uh, first off, welcome back in person. This is wild seeing so many people in person again. Uh, working from home with all of my colleagues nowhere near my state even, much less my office. Um, I don't see very many people and <laughs> this, is, this is different. Uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, as for why you're hearing from me, well, I think you saw me up on stage just a few minutes ago, so you know I'm involved in the project. I've been working on Ditto and Ditto OT for a long time now and also editor of the specification, but we're not here so much to talk about that today, so feel free to question me later. And uh, today I'm here to talk about Ditto OT and specifically getting off of old versions. So the first survey for the crowd, does anyone here feel trapped on an old version of the toolkit? No. Oh, okay, good. I'm, I was surprised. Most of the time there are people on really old versions, but I guess maybe they don't feel so trapped. Second survey, uh, is anyone here using an older version of the toolkit? I think everyone. I was going to say, this is kind of a trick question and you're all falling for it. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I would have to assume everybody in the crowd updated to Ditto OT 4.0 between the first session and this one, which <laughs> unlikely. Um, yeah, we'll talk about why people are on older versions. Um, is there anyone here that's on the 1.x series? Okay. What? You won't believe it, but there are some I do believe it. I would not believe it if nobody raised their hands. Uh, every session I've been in for the past eight, nine years, when did 1.8.5 come out? Um, yeah, there are always people on the older versions. It's hard to get off of them. It can be. Uh, who here is running 2.x? A couple of the same people. That's always intriguing. Early 3.x? Couple more, late 3.x, most of the crowd. I guess that shouldn't surprise me. If you're willing to make the trip all the way to a Ditto OT conference, you're probably gonna be like more than average on, on the newer versions, but that's good to see. Uh, is there anyone here not using Ditto OT? For different things. I mean, yeah. Don't book for instance, they don't use the Ditto OT. Sure, sure, um, yeah. All right, uh, so fortunately, I think the advice I have on the oldest releases isn't gonna to apply to most of this crowd because those are the ones with the worst news in store, basically. Uh, but we're gonna talk about what we should consider when thinking about upgrading. Uh, talk about whether it's best to upgrade in pieces or all at once. I have gotten questioned many times talking to different people. Should I just upgrade version by version? And they don't usually like my answer. Uh, a summary of what you're missing if you're not on recent releases, and uh, also some cats. Uh, so anyone here familiar with technical debt, the concept of technical debt? I would guess most people are. Anybody know how that applies to jetpacks? No? I gave a presentation several years ago trying to encourage people to upgrade to Ditto OT 2.0. It was a couple years after that release came out and a lot of people were not upgrading. In fact, at that point, most people were not upgrading. It's kind of a talk about why and sort of related it to, to jetpacks, which became a theme for a little bit why. And the reason that technical debt can keep you from getting jetpacks is basically, you know, imagine 100, 120 years ago when people are starting to innovate in new ways of transportation and they say, I have this great idea. And the powers that be come down and say, I love it. I love your ideas. I love new ideas. They're great. New ideas can take us all kinds of new places. But whatever you do, if you have new ideas about how to take us new places, they have to stay on the same size track that we're using today. Every new form of transportation, change as much as you want, but don't change the track. Well, you're never going to get a jetpack if you have to stay on the tracks. So I sort of related that. like. Maybe did an OT 185 wasn't quite that limiting, but many things about it were. Like we had to start leaving things behind. Up through 185, the toolkit and the developers had made a really strong effort to not break anything. Like if you customized code anywhere, if you made any changes, if you made any overrides, they would continue to work. And that got harder and harder to keep going. Uh, particularly since the toolkit development team has never been very large. We've never had 
uh, a big set of developers to support old things. And so it's hard to do new things if they have to keep working constantly uh, with the old code. So we started breaking them. And we've been breaking them ever since. Just not very often or very fast. Uh, so Ditto OT 2.0 was the first time that we really intentionally set out to let go of some, some of those old constraints. And yeah, we really wouldn't have been able to do most of what's come since then if we'd tried to hold on to everything else. Uh, so why did we get rid of it? Apart from that, that whole technical debt issue, uh, it does improve the user experience. If you find out you're doing something the wrong way, or if it's hard to do something, let's get rid of that and make it easier. Uh, reducing technical debt is really important. Uh, that reduces overhead on developers. We don't have to focus on the old stuff anymore. And it lets us create new ways of going about things. And it's, it's hard to keep supporting. Like One of the things that we got rid of early on was just the way of starting the toolkit. And I, th I think we went through like four or five designs in the first seven or eight years where we put out the toolkit. And initially, to get the toolkit even running, you had to separately download Ant. And you had to separately download Saxon and all these things. And it was hugely complex. And we said, OK, let's bundle it together. And we bundled it. But it was hard to start. And so we created a batch file. And that was a little bit difficult. It's like, OK, well, let's make a Java command line that you can run. And by 185, I think we had four or five different paths that you could take to start the toolkit. And it was kind of ridiculous. And we got rid of all of those and replaced them with one simpler one, which is what we're still running today. And it's kind of like, if we don't try those new designs, we never get to the actual usable experience. But if we keep supporting the old ones, then everything falls apart. So yeah, we also need to get rid of these old things to prepare, pre prepare for the future. So now, thinking about what we have changed over time, what's come with these new releases, um, in Ditto 2.0, the big changes, and this is really a summary. There's going to be a little more detail later. Uh, we started shifting the code to XSLT 2.0, which was a big shift. Uh, we refactored all sorts of transforms and directories. I mean, the toolkit started out as kind of a hack project on IBM Developer Works, and it was just a downloadable zip of tools where we hadn't put a lot of thought into where things go. Like, is this optimally organized for the future? Uh, none of that thought went into the first releases. And then we had to hold on to those directory structures. And in 2.0, we finally said, we can shift these things. We might break somebody's XSLT import because a file is moved, but we're actually going to have something that makes sense. So there was a lot of refactoring. Uh, we started shifting from XHTML to HTML5. And that, that big Ditto command, that was a big change for usability. We had a bunch of releases that came out in the 2.x series uh, before we hit 3.0. And the biggest change that was started with 3.0 was map-first processing. And anybody here know what map-first processing is? We've got the, the developer of it back there knows what it is. Anybody don't know what it is? OK, so 90% of the crowd is somewhere in the middle. You both know and don't know. <laughs> have to figure that out later. Uh, just in case people don't know what it is, it's how data processing probably would have been done in Ditto OT 1.0 if we knew everything that we'd known by 10 years later. Um, sometimes you learn things over 10 years. And in 1.0, we had the idea that we would try to optimize processing and do things as fast as we could. So we would start to read the map. And every time we encounter a file reference, we'd go check it out and just sort of go through everything. And then we'd do conref for map and topic. And we'd do all, like, basically, it was kind of jumbled. It was see where it makes sense to run this process and shove it in there. Map first processing, by years later, particularly as Ditto grew and started to add more functionality where the map context mattered, like with keys, we realized years later it's a lot easier to process Ditto if you read the whole map first, like all the maps that you're referencing, evaluate everything in there, evaluate all of your keys, evaluate as much as you can without even looking at the topics. And then you go look at the topics, and you have a lot less to figure out while you're in there. And 3.0 introduced map-first processing, which did that. And I know some data processors that came along later took that approach from the start. They learned from our mistakes. So 3.0 introduced that. Um, PDF switched over to map-first processing, and I think did a lot better for it. 
HTML still runs on the old preprocess, so the old one's still in there, although if you are creating your custom uh, plugins, I would encourage you to use that even for HTML. That's what I do. In 3.0, we also started removing support for XSLT 1.0. It started throwing errors when you use it and started getting rid of old plugins. 4.0, is it really going to break things? Well, that switch to Java 17 is probably the biggest one. Uh, so we are, it is breaking some functionality from the old code, but not much. So for those of you who are concerned with upcoming migrations, uh, you look at the path ahead, and you, you may see this picture and think, oh gosh, I got to get in a raft. Well, no. So for those of you who are on 185, the three of you that admitted to it anyway, uh, you're kind of up on that cliff up here. So does anybody have a guess where 2.0 is? Pretty high. Pretty high. Oh, no. no, no, you're all the way down there. It's a, it's a jump. <laughs> it's a big jump. To get to 3.0, you've got to cross that river. By 3.7, a little bit of climbing. And as I said, 4.0 doesn't, doesn't really push you much further. So there's a lot of work. And so when you're thinking about doing this, like, you're going to climb all the way down and across one step at a time, or you just, you're just going to jump. So common things that prevent people from, from migrating. I'm curious how many people in the audience have run into this one. You're blocked by vendor requirements. There's nothing you can do because the vendor you are on, yep, got some, some nods. Nobody knows how this works anymore. Some of the same people. <laughs> Does anybody have a plugin that they just don't really even know how they would go about upgrading because someone wrote it for them? Glad we have Brianna in the call in the room. She's answering every question. Well, I'm answering on behalf of all my. I know. Okay. <laughs> I pretty much everything. Yep. <laughs> Anybody here customized the core code and couldn't figure out how to undo that? Uh, is there anybody in the crowd who just thinks the new releases don't have anything we need, so why bother? I'm glad nobody raised their hand at that. I'm surprised a little bit. Uh, does anybody think any of those reasons on the previous slide were valid? Anybody think I'm going to say they were valid? I actually think the first three are, are things you can't get past. Like if you have a vendor who won't let you upgrade, there's nothing you can really do. Like you can tell the vendor I need to upgrade, but if they won't do it, you're stuck. Uh, if you bought a plugin from a consultant and you don't know how it works, you are equally stuck until you can either learn how to use it or you know, find someone who does. So yeah, there are certainly valid reasons not to upgrade. But that last one, uh, which I'm glad nobody raised their hand about, uh, it has nothing I need. I, I wonder how many of you these days have tools running on your desktops in a corporate environment that warn you when you have some insecure library somewhere or you know there's a log4j exploit that the whole world is freaking out about and you don't know if you have it. Those kind of things hit the libraries that the toolkit uses just like every other project and yeah those those updates don't go into the old code. So that that alone is generally a good reason to upgrade. So if you are thinking about upgrading, of course, the first question is, how many versions do I want to go? You've got to figure that out. Uh, importantly, and you may not think about this initially, if you are making a jump across a lot of versions, you've got to think about what you want to keep. And that may not be quite as obvious. You just sort of assume, well, I've got this plugin. I want to get the same thing working again in the new version. But maybe you don't. Maybe some of it's obsolete now. And importantly, create a test plan. So if you're worried about what's coming, there are reasons to be worried. Uh, the big one, of course, is if you hacked the core code. Code moves around. Core code changes. If you just went in there and changed the code, you're going to have a hard time updating. Uh, if you're on 1.8 1 1 earlier with a lot of XSLT, it's probably got hard-coded paths to files that are no longer there or files that moved. That's going to prove tricky for you. And of course, if your plugin came from a consultant, even worse if it came from a consultant that didn't give you any documentation or any kind of a test plan. I hear that happens once in a while. So I don't know anything about the setup of almost everybody in this room. So knowing nothing, I'm going to say upgrade to the latest. 
and leave it at that. Anybody think that's a problem? Anybody want to argue that? <laughs> I broke that news to somebody I work with recently, and he was not happy to hear it. But yeah. yeah. I, I would say, for instance, if I would upgrade, probably I would upgrade not necessarily to the four that was released at night, <laughs> but <laughs> for some reason, George does not want to upgrade to last night's release. Um, Just if I would go for production, yeah, yep. like immediately, I will. I think it's I think it's a, it's a Sunday. Um, you should all push 4.0 out to your production servers before anyone gets in tomorrow. You'll be good. Um, your devs will appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So, why the latest, or maybe for George's case, the latest minus one? Uh, there is no long-term support for older releases. Uh, you saw the giant Ditto OT development team get up here to somewhat slowly announce the new release. Um, that is the Ditto OT development team. We do have contributions from others, uh, some others in this room, but it's not a big team. Uh, we don't have people out there supporting old releases. And I mentioned security. In general, security fixes only go into the new releases. I think they're, you know, if something as big as that log4j export exploit a year ago came out and it hit one of our libraries, we might release a new version of 3.7 that fixed it. But most things will not be fixed there. And this is something that I see regularly. You know, I, I have monthly reports that run across all the systems I use at work where there's some JavaScript library or some jar file that has a new exploit and you must upgrade it or else your system's not compatible. And you just you have to keep up with those things. And those updates to our libraries are going to go into the new release. If you do have a problem uh, unrelated to security and you say, I can't get this to work, you know, why is this not working as I expected? First question is always going to be, have you tried it in the new release? And if your response is, I would, but I'm on 1.8.5, like, you're not going to get much. And yeah, consider how long before your next upgrade. Like if you are making an update of several releases, how often have you done that? My guess, if you're several releases back, is not very often. So take the opportunity to move to the most recent you can, and then maybe sit there for another couple of years. So what do you get for updating? Uh, most of you do not admit to being on 1.8.5. So this part, well, I, I guess on early 2.0. So this part, maybe you're all familiar with these. Uh, but this is, I'm not going to read all of these, but it's a list of the features that we've released over time. And putting this together, I was kind of amazed how much we've done uh, with the small team we have. Uh, but yeah, starting in 2.0, we had the new ditto command. I don't know why there's brackets around that. It's not an XML element. Um, 2.1 added a bunch of new features. 2.2 added a bunch more. We finally started to have ditto 1.3 support. So if you want to use the latest ditto, uh, it's still ditto 1.3. And if you're before 2.2, you can't get any of that. And 2.2, uh, I think it was even beta support at that point. Uh, we have been introducing over time a lot more support for languages. Uh, the generated text, the index sorting in PDF has been increasing over time. Uh, we have a lot of updates to PDF, a lot of updates to HTML5. Back uh, in the early 2.0 series, HTML5 wasn't really even there. The little HTML5 support we had was basically build XHTML and then change the doc type in a couple of elements. Um, that's no longer the case. 2.5 had multiple data valves. That was a big one that was important for some of my customers. Uh, the, the ability to pass in multiple filter files from the command line. So you didn't have to have one giant data file with all of your conditions. 3.x, uh, these, these features really start to pile up. We had the markdown, uh, the map first processing that I mentioned earlier. I uh, started to add markdown support. 3.1. A lot more, we've got a lot more support for RelaxNG. We've got a lot more Ditto 1.3 features coming out over time. And uh, as I said, I'm not going to read all of these, but these slides will be available afterwards if you want this summary. Or you can just go through all of our release notes. Uh, more 3.x kept on adding more and more and more. Uh, we, at this point, now have some Ditto 2.0 preview functions out there. Uh, of course, Ditto 2.0 is not a standard yet, and so we don't have everything, but we've got a lot of support for some early features. And then over the, the 10 years since, is it 10 years, 9 years since 1.8.5, uh, yeah, hundreds of fixes and smaller enhancements. So who in here 
can confidently say, I know how to upgrade my plugins if I need to. Got a few. Good. Uh, who in here would quake in fear and say, I don't want to do that if I don't have to? OK, maybe not quake in fear, but just don't want to do it. <laughs> oh, OK, a few more. Uh, so yeah, what skills will you need to upgrade Like, if you do need to get in there? If a consultant built this for you, it really depends on what sort of customizations you have in the first place, which you might expect. Um, if you've upgraded or if you've got custom code that works with XSLT, you're going to need an XSL developer or at least someone who can hack around. Um, if you're stuck on 1X, yeah, that, that's going to be the hard one. Most of you are not, so we're good there. In 1.X, you probably had hard-coded file paths and those files have moved. Um, that's going to be a pain to figure out. It's not particularly complicated, but it's a pain to figure out. Um, HTML5 uh, is now an entirely separate thing, so you don't really, like if you were building HTML5 off of uh, the 185 releases, you were doing it by hacking the XHTML, and that's entirely separate now. Uh, the XSLT, yeah, we've, we've updated that many times. It really moved to 2.0, everything's moved to 2.0, the files have all moved around, they've been reorganized. Uh, we've gotten rid of uh, named templates largely in favor of modes. If you don't use XSLT, you don't have to worry about what that means. Uh, yeah, a whole lot of PDF changes just to clean up the code. So if you are at that point, if you're on 185, I strongly recommend starting from scratch, which is painful to hear. Uh, this is where I had somebody that I work with recently say that we have a lot of tools built on 185. How do I move them? And they were really hoping I would say, it's easy, just go step by step, one release at a time, and it's not worth it. Uh, there's, it'd be too much to figure out that way. As I say here, in my last job, I jumped from 1.7. I'm pretty sure I jumped straight to 3.2. It might have been 3.1 and then upgrade, but I think it was to 3.2. And the way that I did that, we had a, a lot of custom code. And I didn't worry about the intermediate releases. I just ignored that. I went straight from one to the other. And the way that I did that was to set up a new plugin based on 3.2 that did nothing. So start out with just a plugin that's there. And so if I was overriding XHTML in the old one, I'd create a template that overrides XHTML in the new one, but doesn't do anything yet. So just test, and you basically prove, OK, good. I've got out of the box 3.2 XHTML. Next thing I do is look at the first template in my old plugin and try to figure out if I even needed it. Uh, so that plugin had grown over 10 years, and it wasn't particularly well documented, which I blame, well, I blame the developer who worked on that, which was the much younger me who did not know what he was doing, uh, did not document everything. So first I had to figure out what do these templates do? Second, do I even need it anymore? And in many cases I didn't. Like this was some feature we thought we might use, but actually 10 years later nobody's using it. Or it was an override for something that would fix a problem that existed in Dita OT 1.2. And we'd been in there with our override maintaining this custom code for something that had been fixed six or seven years earlier. Throw those out. Throw out everything you can. If you decide you still need the template, copy it into the new one and see if it works. You know, figure out what it does, see if it works. If it does work and you want to keep it, document it. Put code comments in there saying, this is why we have this template. And maybe even, this is what would happen to let us get rid of this template. It'll make your upgrades much easier in the future. So yeah, do we still need it? If so, copy it over and does it still work? If not, that's when you have to actually fix the code. So yes, document each change, very important. If you're on 2.x, it's not as difficult to consider upgrading. The biggest things are behind you, but there is still some stuff to do. The XSLT 1.0 code that you might have been relying on from years past is going to start throwing errors. Uh, we started typing all of our variables. If you had something that was passed through in a variable, uh, that, may, that may no longer work. You may suddenly get unexpected errors. Not too hard to fix. If you are moving from 2.x to the latest, switch to map-first processing if you can, just because it's simpler and faster. And it is still a good idea as you go to reevaluate your plugins and make sure that everything is still necessary. So if you're already on 3. something, which most of the people in this audience claim to be, which is good, um, Try it and see. Try your plugin and see if it works. It may work out of the box. I think there's a decent chance if you've got something based on 3.x, you're not going to have much work to move. In this case, it might even be worth stepping version from version, or version to version, because most of them 
you're just going to be able to copy the plugin and make sure that it works. And so if you move from 3.2 to 3.3, it might be easy to find that one thing that changed uh, that you need to update. Uh, we do try to keep pretty good track of deprecated items in the release notes. And they're, they're good release notes and good migration instructions in the toolkit documentation that tell you what has changed, how you need to accommodate when things are deprecated. And this just lists a few things that have gone away over time in the 3.x releases. And most of these are removed because they're old things that we don't use anymore, like these old plugins, uh, TROF. Does anybody here still need TROF? And if so, can I say I'm, I'm sad for you? That was a, that was a terrible, I, I had to create that plugin and I hated it. Um, hated supporting that. Who here in the audience has done major upgrades and is willing to confess to it? How did it go? Is anybody willing to say? Slowly. Slowly. <laughs> so the, the way it went forward was basically take vanilla and slowly uh, recreate the necessary plugins to do whatever's necessary. Now, at the same time, because this was done by the Big Bang approach, at the same time we're updating the, uh, the look and feel of the uh, print documents. So it was a matter of, okay, we'll rewrite that plugin completely. Mm -hmm. Does that look right? And the thing is, the problem with that is that you aren't covering any edge, uh, edge cases if you are doing uh, manual checking of your documentation. So you'd find out that, oh, well, actually, you know, the, uh, um, uh, I don't know, code pH isn't in a monospace fault. Mm -hmm. right? But only because someone noticed it once it actually gone out the door and uh, someone was shouting at you. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, depending on how customized you were, uh, it was a reasonable choice to basically throw it away and start all over again if you are that far uh, out, out, out of the way. Didn't actually, uh, uh, that option did go down very well with management, but it was actually the right thing to do because uh, I think, I can't remember which version it was, it was 2.3 or 2.5, no, right, I think, uh, uh, and in Korean support, we needed something for Korean customers or something like that. So there was a business need to do this regardless. Uh, so we had to get get the thing in. And um, at some point, it was a case of, well, actually, what we've got is rubbish. <laughs> How can we uh, refactor the rubbish into a decent uh, viewport? Which is actually one of the reasons why I created some new test uh, plugins, because. Actually, doing the manual checking is tedious, uh, incomplete, and the sort of thing which computers do a lot better. Yep. So if you can, if you can uh, get a, a test case which says this is what we are expecting, it's much easier to let the machine say, uh, computer says no, and yep. then try and debug what's going wrong rather than saying, okay, we'll do it this way. The problem, of course, was by taking a big bang approach, we knew everything was wrong. Yep. That, that sounds similar to my experience. So the, the advice there, I guess, restating, I should have handed over the mic for this because probably none of that was recorded. Uh, but yeah, taking the, the approach of basically throwing it all away and starting over. Um, one advantage I had over you, I think, is that when I had to make that jump, I didn't have to look at it and say, I don't know who made all these things because I made them. It doesn't mean I remembered what they did. Um, but yeah, the, the bit about unit testing is incredibly important. And particularly if you have things that are really old and you don't remember what they did, now think about, I'm upgrading now. If I'm going to have to do this again in five or six years, am I going to remember what these did again? Am I going to know how to test this? If you can set up some kind of automated test, you know, I've got this change that turns my HTML, like make sure that this HTML output comes out with a particular class. Well, set up an automated test to make sure it's there and then you don't have to worry about whether you accidentally lose it the next time you upgrade. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. Uh, going along with that, I would also say it is even harder if you're trying to rework your styles in the middle of that upgrade. But yeah, 
Anybody else have experience doing big upgrades or think that it might be easier to go one at a time? No? Oh, yes? Mm -hmm. and that fit better in what you want to do anyway. So that's um, I think basically the best point. Don't try to do the piece by piece. And we had another one there. Yeah, we, we've been upgrading from 185 to the uh, 361. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so moving from Ditto OT 1.2 to 3.6, yeah. I have not heard of a jump that big. That may win an award for this room, I'm not sure. Um, we have a sticker for you if you'd like. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think making the jump to the latest is good, and I'm glad to hear that the new plugins make sense. Like it was, it was really hard after those first many years of not wanting to break anything and really struggling to hold on to everything we'd done before and not move any files. And part of that came from uh, the like at the time my team in IBM was really the one that was running the project. Like we were doing pretty much all of the development. And we had complex inter internal tools that were built around the toolkit. And you know, if we moved files, those tools break. And I knew that would hit me. I knew it would hit anyone else run working in a similar situation, which made us just not want to move files. And it's Yarno's fault, sorry, Yarno's credit um, that he came in and basically said, this is foolish. Like, we can't keep holding on to these things. You have to break things once in a while. And like you said, the new stuff is so much better organized and easier to use. And that's what we get from it. Like, if we hadn't broken these things, we would still have a mess of code that's hard to customize. It'd still be possible, but it would be hard. And yeah, some of those old things might move more easily, and the paths wouldn't break. But yeah, everybody else who's trying to customize new would be in a harder spot. So I'm glad that you're finding the new stuff easier to, to adapt to. Anybody else have migration horror stories? Yes? Yeah. 
processing, you're going to get different outputs. Yeah, so the, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. A lot of these customizations are built around how you use data and the classes and your specializations that you might use. And that is one thing to evaluate when you're upgrading. And that's one of the things where I said I found things that, in, in my big leap forward, uh, I found things that we had thought we would use and we didn't. Like there was a bunch of code around some class values. And we didn't have one big CMS that held everybody's stuff, so I couldn't verify nobody was using it. But I had access to a lot of our user content. And I would look, and this class doesn't appear anywhere. It's like, why do we have all this code in here to support something that nobody's using? And so that part just doesn't get upgraded. Throw it away. And yeah, it's, a, it's, it's important to remember how you're using data. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm not sure how we're doing. Oh, OK. I am almost caught us up on time. Good. Uh, who participates in Ditto OT? Uh, you saw most of us, and the rest of us you can find in this room. Um, no, there are, there are a few others who couldn't make it here. But yeah, it's uh, that link on the top of this page. There's a page on our site that says who contributes. Uh, has me and Yarno and Roger, but as well as Radu, uh, John, has been, John Kirkless in the crowd here has been committing uh, some updates as well. So yeah, we've got a number of people who uh, put in fixes, and that's great. Uh, we do host regular committer calls or contributor calls uh, that has, have 8 to 12 people so every month. Uh, if you want to participate in those, I think I send the invite out to like 50 people. As I say, there are 8 to 12 that come regularly. Uh, so you can come once in a while. I see some embarrassed looks, those of you who get these invites and never show up. I'm not going <coughs> to call you out. Um, but yes, if you want to, if you want to uh, come to those, let me know. Uh, let Radu know. Uh, Oxygen or Synchrosoft does host those, which is wonderful. And of course, anybody can open a pull request against the project. Uh, the resources here are project site. Uh, the migration instructions are done release to release, and I think those actually go back to Ditto OT 1.5. So if you did want to make the wrong approach of going one by one, you could do that. Uh, a lot of the information that I have here in this, is, this presentation is really a summary of those migration notes. And uh, that version next project board is actually obsolete as of this morning. Uh, we'll be moving on to our, a new project board for the following release. And yes, most of the pictures in here were my own cats. Any questions? Things I did not cover about migrating. Anybody have that one terrible thing that happened that they're still bitter about during their migration? No, it all went smoothly for everybody. That's excellent. All right, thank you. <laughs>